This is the Sleeper Hold Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Sleeper Hole Podcast, where there is no disqualification on the topics and falls count anywhere. I am your host, Priest, and we are continuing on with the Women in Wrestling series. This is episode two of that series. First one was kicked off last week by my wife, whom you may call Mistress. And she did a great job, and I do want to talk a little bit about the Women in Wrestling before we get on to the series with our topic You know, there's been a lot of great stuff going on, and the women have always done a great role when it comes to wrestling. Even on times where when I was growing up, I was kind of like, this is kind of weird for family entertainment, but hey, I'm not complaining, you know, growing up a teenager. But still, honestly, the women have done such a great role throughout the ages, and I love it right now more than anything. We have the Divas Revolution. There's so much going on there. Three stables, possibly now going to be four for my prediction because I think Paige is going to go to her wayside after the feud with her and Natty. Really looking forward to seeing how that one spikes because, you know, Natty is my girl and I like Paige too. But, I mean, you have people like Sasha Banks and you have Charlotte and you have Becky Lynch, three girls who are really still new to the big time WWE, but have done such great things, and they're so talented. I mean, you got Team Bad, Team Bella, and Team, well, CB for right now, and that's a great thing for this company, that letting the women really stand out like that, that's great, I'm really happy about it. And and going to NXT even, NXT, oh my goodness, they have been doing great, they've been really highlighting the women. And this Iron Man match that we just saw between Sasha Banks and Bailey was so phenomenal. And, you know, Bailey's really grown on me. Well, she pretty much was always one that I liked. But even now, seeing that more rough and rugged side of her, if you push her too hard, you push her too far, she gets her main streak. Gotta love it. That's definitely awesome. Keep up the good work, Bailey. But, you know, talking about all these women you got to remember that there's been so many different times, so many different milestones in the women in the wrestling world and their history that one that gets easily overlooked unless you are just a big fan comes from during the 90s, about early to mid-90s. And what I'm talking about is simply this. When you think of the Monday Night Wars between the World Championship Wrestling and the World Wrestling Federation, Many things may come to your mind. You may think of the NWO versus DX, or Bischoff versus McMahon, or even how talent constantly was known to either jump from one company to another, or sometimes even back to the original company. But those of us, like myself, who do a lot of hardcore research or do know their wrestling history, one thing that really comes to our mind and stands out is the one woman who is dubbed as the person who delivered first blood between the two companies by throwing her championship title from one company into the other company's trash can. That woman is a lunger blaze. But there is more to this woman than that one pivotal moment in history. Alundra Blaze started out in the American Wrestling Association as Medusa Miselli. It is said that Medusa was actually supposed to be short for Made in the USA. She began with a feud against Sensational Sherry, who also went by a different name during that time. Two classic women and what would have been an incredible feud, if you ask me. So when Sherry left the AWA, Medusa became the manager for Kevin Kelly. On December 27, 1987, Medusa won the AWA World Women's Championship after defeating Candy Devine in the final match. 
During this time, Medusa also ended up managing for Kurt Henning, who was later called Mr. Perfect. On November 26, 1988, Medusa did lose her title to Wendy Richter before her and Henning would join the Diamond Exchange, a stable that Diamond Dallas Page was the leader of and had the team Bad Company included in. Medusa teamed up with Bad Company to go against Top Guns and Wendy Richter at the AWA pay-per-view Super Clash 3, where both the tag team titles and the women's championship were on the line. Richter penned Medusa for the win, but thankfully Bad Company didn't end up losing their titles either. 1988 was also the year where Medusa was awarded as the first woman in Pro Wrestling Illustrated's Rookie of the Year. At the start of 1989, Medusa toured in Japan for six weeks with All Japan Women's Pro Wrestling. She defeated the IWA Women's Champion, Chigusa Nagayo, but lost it back to her the following day. With her hard work and dedication, though, Medusa became the first non-Japanese wrestler to sign a three-year contract with All Japan. She also worked a feud with Luna Vashun, which resulted in a hair-versus-hair tag match in September of 1991, where Medusa won and Luna had to have her head shaved. And trust me, if you've seen Luna, it's no surprise that she would let her head get shaved. She's kind of a wild one out there. You know, for a small moment of time, Medusa did come to the World Championship Wrestling as a valet for Rick Rude and and Paul E. Dangerously's team. It was a short-lived moment in her career, so not many people even know about it or even put two and two together with it. But if you do want to see bits and chunks of it, though, I do advise just watching the 1992 Halloween Havoc as well as the 92 Clash of Champions pay-per-view. In 1993, the WWF reinstated the Women's Championship, which had been left vacant since 1990. Medusa was brought into the company to help revive the women's division. She was brought in under a new name, though, Alundra Blaze. It is said that Vince McMahon didn't want her to be using a name that she had already trademarked. As the vacant title was returned to the public, a six-woman tournament was held to decide who would be the champion. On December 13th of 1993, Alundra Blaze pinned Heidi Lee Morgan for the title. More women would add it to the roster to go up against Alundra, and on different occasions she had lost and regained the title between women who helped build great feuds against her. However, in December of 1995, Alundra was released from her contract and stripped of her title after her famous jump over to World Championship Wrestling, leaving the Women's Championship vacant until 1998. This also left Alundra blacklisted by the WWF for approximately about 20 years. So why was it a big deal that she jumped over to WCW? Well, it mainly is due to her actions when she was over to the rival company, which also has been dubbed as the official first blood of the Monday Night Wars. Sleeper Hole Podcast is proud to be partnered up and broadcasting with 217 Radio, an internet radio station in the Central Illinois area. To keep up with our new weekly schedule, our show is aired every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, and yours truly also has another show at that same time every Wednesday where I freely speak my mind on some of the news locally and nationally. But you don't only get to listen to me. There's great music and incredible shows from other hosts as well. Soon, I will be super looking forward to the show that talks about the paranormal and does the little investigations. I'm a big paranormal junkie, so that one's going to be awesome once it gets up and going. Wednesdays also has 217 Problems, which is from the same great creator of 217 Problems, which is named and shown on Facebook. Now, Pickett, he's one of the producers of 217 Radio, and he has the Pickett's Movie Show on Saturdays, which is great for those who want to review on what movies to check out 
And I'm looking forward to seeing my buddy Jeremy Bailey launch Lincoln's Legends on the Thursday night slot. Now, this is a big time growing show, so let me tell you, many shows are being added as days roll by and there's many things going on. So I am very, very sure there's going to be so many great things to check out as new shows are added and there's something for everybody. So what are you waiting for? Just go to 217radio.com. Sit back, relax, and enjoy some great shows and a great variety of music. When Alundra moved back to WCW in December of 1995, she was still the WWF Women's Champion and didn't know what to do with the title. Coerced by Eric Bischoff, she did the most devastating thing that Bischoff could think of and Alundra would later regret. During an airing of WCW Monday Nitro, Alundra threw the WWF Women's Championship belt into a trash can, stating that it was what she thought of the company and their title. Along with this, she declared she was once more going to be going under the name Medusa. Her first feud in WCW was against Bull Nakano, which led to a match in the 1996 Hog Wild, where Medusa destroyed Bull's motorcycle right after the match. The WCW Women's Championship was then established, but Akira Hokuto would be crowned the Women's Champion in a tournament where the final match was against Medusa at Starcade. At the following Great American Bash, Medusa faced Hokuto in a title versus career match, where she lost and had to take a two-year hiatus from the company. So in April of 1999, Medusa did return to WCW as part of Team Madness, which was led by Macho Man Randy Savage. After that storyline, though, Medusa did enter into a tournament for the WCW Championship, where she did unfortunately lose. After her loss, she focused on managing Evan Courageous, who would end up winning the WCW World Cruiserweight Championship at Mayhem. Courageous was also flirting with Spice from the Nitro Girls, and at Starcade, Courageous was given a low blow by Spice during the match, which led him vulnerable to having Medusa pin him and become the first female WCW World Cruiserweight Champion. After that point, Medusa was the champion and had Spice as pretty much her valet for a time being. And Medusa's next rivalry was actually in 2000 against Oklahoma. The two had an evening gown match during the WCW Thunder, where Medusa won, but when it came to sold-out pay-per-view, she lost her cruiserweight title to Oklahoma. Weird, wacky stuff when it comes to WCW, let me tell you. Along this time, Medusa's focus was becoming redirected as she was now deciding to be more of a trainer. She helped train different divas, such as Molly Holly, and even had a short feud with Tori Wilson. However, when she heard of the WWF buying out the WCW, Medusa decided to not continue her relations with either company, as she had a bad fallout with Mr. McMahon and was not really pleased with the current direction that women's wrestling was heading towards. However, this wasn't the last time we would hear of Medusa, a.k.a. Alundra Blaze. On March of 2015, she was inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame under her alias, Alundra Blaze. She was honored, but promised that the mean side, Medusa, would still be heard. During her speech at the Hall of Fame, Natalia Neidhart, who had inducted Alundra, wheeled over a trash can to the stage, and Alundra pulled out the women's championship she had dumped in the past and declared that it was, quote, back home where it belongs while also declaring that she was still the reigning WWF Women's Champion since it was never taken away physically. So now that she's retired from the ring, what does this one major star in women's wrestling do? She rides a monster truck for her career. What else? You expect a bad girl like Medusa to just be knitting instead of watching stuff crush under the giant wheels of a truck she's driving? You obviously weren't paying attention to this episode then. Here at the Sleeper Hold Podcast, we strongly believe in helping others. 
This quarter, the Sleeper Hold podcast is going pink with Susan G. Komen as we join the Rise Above Cancer campaign. Susan G. Komen is the world's largest nonprofit funder of breast cancer research. Breast cancer is the most commonly diagnosed cancer in the world and the second leading cause of cancer-related deaths among women in the United States. There are already more than 3.1 million breast cancer survivors now in the United States, and your contributions will help with the research and work to increase the number of survivors of breast cancer. For more information or to make your donation, visit thesleeperhold.com and click on the Susan G. Komen link. All right, guys, we talked a little bit about the next person. We gave her an honorable mention, but I definitely feel like we need to make sure we talk about her. She's been very dominant in the ring before. She's been a dominant manager, and I am sorry, but she's intimidating as heck to me. She definitely fits her description as scary. So I'm talking about Scary Sherry. Sherry Martell was first introduced to professional wrestling as a child when her mother took her and her sister to a show in Mississippi. In 1974, Sherry Martell approached Grizzly Smith for advice on becoming a wrestler, but when he questioned her conviction, he told her to come back in five years when she was an adult. So Sherry did get married and had a normal life, but during the time of her marriage, she then became interested again in becoming a professional wrestler, and she sought out training from Mr. Personality Butch Moore in Memphis, Tennessee. And as she started wrestling there, she decided she needed more training and continued her training under the fabulous Moolah, where she did also go and do a lot of training and some wrestling, but eventually she did get kicked out of there as Mula accused her of being too much of a party animal, going to nightclubs and everything else. However, from what we've been told, there may be some back and forth allegations. So can't really put anything there except for her face value. Now, Sherry did return back to Tennessee for her wrestling and she was managed by Jim Cornette. But unfortunately, during a mixed battle royale, she did suffer an injury that did remove her from the wrestling world temporarily. So after recovering, Larry Zabisco did help her join the American Wrestling Association, where Sherry did eventually debut on September 28th of 1985 at Super Clash in Chicago. During her debut, she defeated Candy Devine for the AWA World Women's Championship. The two did trade the belt back and forth in title holds. However, Martel's third championship uh, reign with that would be on June 28th of 1986, and it was her also her final time of having the World Women's Championship before having it briefly vacated. Former AWA wrestler Jesse the Body Ventura did refer Sherry to the World Wrestling Federation, where she debuted on July 24th, 1987, and defeated the fabulous Mula for the WWF Women's Championship. This is also the time where Sherry renamed herself as the Sensational Sherry, a name that has stuck with her to this day. She reigned as the WWF Women's Champion for 15 months before she lost it to the Rockin' Robin on October 8th of 1988. Now, at the Survivor Series in 1987, Sherry's team consisted of Sensational Sherry, the Women's World Tag Team Champions, known as the Glamour Girls, Don Marie, and Donna Cristinello. Now, they did unfortunately lose to the Fabulous Moolah's team, consisting of Moolah herself, Velvet McIntyre, Rockin' Robin, and the Jumpin' Bomb Angels. And when the WWF phased out the women's division in 1990, Sherry remained with the company, but turned her attention to managing the male wrestlers. After WrestleMania V, Sensational Sherry confronted Miss Elizabeth, which led to a brawl between Elizabeth's ally Hulk Hogan and her former ally Randy Savage. Throughout the remainder of 1989, Sherry and Savage feuded with Hogan and Elizabeth, and at SummerSlam, Hogan and Brutus the Barber Beefcake defeated the team of Savage and Zeus. And after the match... Miss Elizabeth knocked out Sherry with Sherry's own purse, leading to where she, Hogan, and the beefcake cut Sherry's hair. 
at WrestleMania 6 in 1990, Sherry and Savage lost a mixed tag match against Sapphire and Dusty Rhodes after Miss Elizabeth, who was in the corner of Sapphire and Rhodes, interfered and shoved Miss Sherry. During the same year, Sherry and Savage appeared on Lifestyles of Rich and Famous, and Sherry ran into the ring to aid Savage in a steel cage match against Jerry the King Lawler, but accidentally knocked Savage from the ring. She had her dress yanked off by Lawler as she climbed the cage to escape. During a steel cage match at the Madison Square Garden, Sherry suffered a similar embarrassment at the hands of the Ultimate Warrior, who pulled off the escaping Sherry's miniskirt to reveal a matching black garter belt and lace underpants. Practically in tears, Sherry raced back to the locker room, and at WrestleMania 7, Savage lost a retirement match against the Ultimate Warrior, where the loser would be forced to retire. After Savage lost the match, an irate Sherry attacked Savage, but was thrown from the ring by Elizabeth, who had been watching from the audience. Later on, during WrestleMania 7, after Sherry and Savage parted ways following the career match, Sherry came to the ring to help the million-dollar man Ted DiBiase in his assault to an injured Roddy Roddy Piper, following where she managed Ted DiBiase until 1992. Sherry began managing Shawn Michaels after Pat Patterson convinced Michaels to participate in a certain storyline. She also sang a Michaels theme song called Sexy Boy. As part of the gimmick, Michaels would admire himself in a full-length mirror before his matches, and in 1992, before his match, his former partner, Marty Jannetty, grabbed the mirror and attempted to hit Michaels with it. However, Shawn Michaels pulled Sherry in front of him. After being hit with the mirror, she was absent from television until the Royal Rumble in January of 93. At the Rumble, she was in a neutral corner for the match between Michaels and Jannetty, but then she turned her back on Michaels during the match. Afterwards, in the backstage area, Michaels confronted Sherry, and Jannetty came to her rescue. However, the storyline was cut short after Jannetty was released from the company while being in the middle of the feud, and Sherry spent the rest of her year aligned with Tatanka, who aided her in the feud between Luna Vashun and Bam Bam Bigelow. Shortly after, she was released from the World Wrestling Federation during the summertime. Once after WWF, she began working with ECW in 1993, managing Shane Douglas. Sherry did also turn on Douglas in a tag match with Brian Pillman, costing Douglas the match on behalf of Ric Flair. In 1994, Sherry joined the World Championship Wrestling, going to the name Sensuous Sherry. She was now managing Ric Flair while he had a feud with Sting and Hulk Hogan. And at Bash at the Beach, she tried to help Flair out by giving him brass knucks to use on Hogan, but of course this failed. And her feud's climactic battle with Hogan and Flair led to a steel cage match at Halloween Havoc, where Sherry tried to climb the cage to help Flair, but in the process... Her dress was pulled off by Jimmy Hart, Hogan's manager at the time, leaving her dangling from the cage in her black lingerie. After that, her management moved over to the Harlem Heat, which was with Booker T and his brother Stevie Ray, using the name Sista Sherry. She managed the team towards seven of their WCW World Tag Team Championships, and while managing the Harlem Heat during her 1994 year, She also made a return appearance to ECW to manage Shane Douglas and Brian Pillman against Ron Simmons and Two Cold Scorpio. Now, back with WCW, she did have a little bit of a romance with Colonel Robert Parker, but that all ended up with a match between them at World War III, and she still managed Harlem Heat until she was fired from them on July 7th of 1997 during an episode of Nitro. Whether it was her actually being in the ring wrestling or just managing some of the toughest talent there was, Sherry has made such a great impact in the wrestling history. And on 2006, she was inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame by Ted DiBiase, a man she had also managed. This was a great honor for her, as it is for many people who get inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame. And unfortunately, though... The year after, on June 15, 2007, we lost 
Sensational Sherry as she passed away at her mother's residence in Alabama. She was 49 years old. Well, gang, that wraps it up for this week as we talked about two great women in the wrestling world. But stay tuned for next week because it's going to get a lot more interesting as we get ready to talk about the ninth wonder of the world. That's right. We're going to talk about China. See you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Sleeper Hold Podcast. Don't forget to visit our website at thesleeperhold.com, comment on episodes, read our blog, find information about our quarterly charity, and more. See you next week.